Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the West Winds Live Show, the digital expression of West Winds Church. My name is Stephanie, and I'll be one of your hosts today. And I'm Danielle. I'll be co-hosting today. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? Good. Did you have a nice weekend so far? I did. It's been pretty good weather so far outside. Yeah, it's it has nice. been nice. And yesterday, my husband and I carved pumpkins. Did you do anything fun? I didn't. I didn't get to carve pumpkins. We went and saw Hotel Transylvania, the was second one. It was actually really funny. Adam Sandler. I have to give it up to him. He is so hilarious. <laughs> Even in cartoons, he's good. Well, I hope you guys are having a good weekend, too. Uh, here at the live show, if you'd like to engage with us by sending us a question or a tweet, you can do that on social media. There's a few ways that you can do that. You can go to our Facebook page, which is Westwinds Live Show. You can go to our Twitter page, which is Westwinds Live. And during our show or during the sermon, if you have a question about the sermon or anything like that, you can send us a message or a question and use the hashtag AskWestwinds. And then later on in the show, Pastor Ben will be in here answering any of the questions that you might have. Yeah, definitely. And today we have a great show planned for you. We're going to have our poll question like we do every week. So we'll, you know, check back on that throughout the show and see what you guys are answering in. We'll also have an interview with Jacob McGarry coming up, telling us what he does here at West Winds, about the videos he makes. Good stuff. Also, we'll have a question and answer session with Ben. He's going to be giving the sermon today, so get your questions in, and we'll have him back here in the studio after the message. And next up, we're going to go on over to Jared, and he's going to let us know about the new uh, West Winds music clip. All right, Stephanie, Danielle, thank you so much. Music is huge here at West Winds. We love the praise. We love to show our love. And we got a new one for you from Victor McDermott. It's called New World. Here it is. Check it out. here with our very own Jacob McGarry. Mm -hmm. So Jacob, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? So I do a lot of the editorial videos uh, for West Wings, which is the stuff that's happening throughout the week. Um, so not the live stream stuff, but all of the content that gets used in the service, um, some of the videos that we see here. Are you the man behind Civ and Recall? I am, yes. Although uh, this week um, we had a volunteer actually come in and stream all of Sandbox, cool. um, which, is, which is what gets turned into Civ. So. Yeah, we're, we're moving away from me directly doing stuff into volunteers doing stuff, which is really exciting. So what is something that you're working on right now? So this week I've been working on a video about a book that Dave is working on. Uh, it's about Christmas myths. Um, so there are a ton of Christmas myths, and these are stories that are not true, um, you know, in the same way that like fairy tales are not true. Um, but we're compiling them. And he's uh, he's kind of combining different sources into these like meta myths, maybe, um, sort of a storybook. Um, and there are some there are some really cool stories in there. Do you have a favorite one? So yes, there's one myth about the Holy Family. Um, so uh, Joseph, Mary, and little baby Jesus yep. they they run away to Egypt, and there's some some crazy stuff that happens on the way. But then when they get there, they get into like the it's it's kind of like the Ellis Island of Egypt. Like the okay. they, they come to register as citizens of Egypt. 
and when they get there, all of the idols in the building, like the Egyptian idols, come to life and throw themselves into a fire. Oh, like, that's interesting. Yes, uh-huh. And then the priest is all angry. I don't remember exactly how it, how it comes down, but like the priest is like spewing like snake and raven demons out of his mouth that are coming and Je- little baby So just Jesus like the like, normal sh- Christmas sh- story, right? Pretty much. Pretty mild. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. These are, you know, very warm, cuddly feeling. <laughs> So, uh, well, how is what you do for West Winds important to our overall ministry? So, a lot of times um, people will come in on a Sunday and they get like a lot of a lot of church. You know, they, um, you know, some people even volunteer and then go to the service, or will stick around for multiple services, or even if they just come for one service, that's like a lot of Jesus all at once. Um, and we have things that happen throughout the week. We have small groups. Um, you know, we have uh, like the live show chat on Monday nights, um, but um, a lot of what I'm doing is giving people content that they can kind of, that, that will remind them during the week um, of either what happened on Sunday or just extra stuff that will kind of help them, you know, have a more steady, um, consistent um, element of God in their lives. That makes sense to me because sometimes you can get a lot on Sunday and mm-hmm. so you might not remember everything. So it's a nice way to bring it back. Mm-hmm. Uh, So the last thing I want to ask is, what do you want people at Westwinds to know about the video that you work on? So the videos that I work on directly, pretty much all of those, the ultimate goal is to have volunteers doing those. Um, So if somebody is interested, even if they don't know how to do it yet, um, if if they've, you know, recorded a video on their cell phone, even if they don't feel like that makes them qualified for this, um, then I would love for them to come and help with, uh, with, they have so many different opportunities, you know, live streaming. Um, editing like the little sandbox clips or the little sieve clips down, um, you know, the, making the recall videos, all of that stuff is some the stuff that, that we want volunteers to be doing ultimately. And what's the best way that people could get a hold of you? So you can find me on Facebook, uh, Jacob McGarry. You can email me at jacob at westwinds.org um, or you can just come track me down in the lobby on a Sunday. So if you're interested in that, feel free to hit up Jacob to do some video. Thank you for being here with us, Jacob. Yeah, thank you for having me. And now we're going to go back to Jared. Oh, man, it's almost time for the message. Recall, you you didn't see it last week. You didn't get the message last week. Here it is, and then we're going to get into the message. So here we go. Thank you. This is not a set of propositions that I believe. This is not like religious, you know, math or some kind of constitutional study. This is a, a vibrant, passionate, personal relationship with the God of the universe in whom all things are possible. And the only reason I know that is because of the experiences I've had over the years where I have acted in spite of my fears, where I have overcome my fears, where I have conquered my fears. And the truth is, man, you're going to be scared. Sometimes life is like that, but that doesn't mean you don't get to act. It means you have to act afraid. If you've never been afraid, you can't ever be brave. And that's why we say that fear is the prelude to courage. So this week we're still studying the book of Acts and we're talking today about how you can be imprisoned by different things. So if you want to be able to engage with us on that, one way you can do that is by answering our poll by texting Westwinds to 22333. And this week's question is, in which areas of your life do you feel the most imprisoned? So if you want to participate in that, you can text Westwinds to 22233 and then give your answer to that question. And the options are relationship, job, money, and personal issues. During the sermon, Ben's going to be talking about those topics, and it's a really good way for you to be involved in the sermon sitting right here at home. Yeah, so we definitely want to hear your answers and what you have to say, and also if you have questions throughout the sermon about the show, about anything really to do with West Winds, send in your question your questions on Facebook or Twitter and use hashtag AskWestWinds. We'll have Ben here in the studio after the sermon to answer some of your questions that you send in to us. And again, we'd love to hear your feedback. We'd love to hear from you and really interact with you. That's what we're here for on the live show. At the 8.30 service, we had people asking a lot of different questions. We had people asking about how Jesus might have an impact on how they might feel imprisoned in their life. Mm -hmm. So if you're listening to the sermon and you just want to know more, please feel free to interact with us. Yeah. Also, during the sermon, if you're interested in doing tithing or giving, you have an opportunity to do that as well. 
There's a few ways to do that. You can go to our website, which is westwinds.org, and go to backslash giving, and you can tithe or give there. You can also use the Secure Give app, which you can download to your phone and give there. So now we're going to head on over to Pastor Ben, who will be giving a sermon on Acts. And after his sermon, he's going to be coming here in the studio to answer any of the questions that you might have. Jared is going to be interviewing him and giving him those questions directly from you. So thank you again so much for being here. We're so happy that you're here with us today. Yes. And also uh, coming up on October 31st, we're going to have Halloween here at Westwinds. If you're interested in bringing your kids in, the theme is Enchanted Forest, and the event goes from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. And don't forget it's inside, so rain, wind, snow, goodness, I hope not, but you never know. any weather, yes, it's indoors, so it'll be a safe, fun family event for all the kids. Lots of candy, so check it out. And what's your favorite Halloween candy? Reese's chocolate peanut oh, butter. I asked you that. Can't go wrong. So now we're going to go over to Ben, and we hope you enjoy the sermon. Uh, this morning we're going to be looking at the deep theological question that was just burning in your souls when you came in this morning, which is this, why would someone sing when they were in prison? I know that's the question everyone was asking, so we'll try to um, figure it out as we go. The text we're looking at this morning is a song about a man named Paul who was doing exactly that, singing while chained up in a prison cell. But let's go back a little bit to figure out uh, how he got there. Um, in, in the book of Acts, uh, the story is told of a young girl who was possessed by a demon. And uh, this girl, because of this demon possession, was um, telling people their fortunes, telling people their futures. Uh, because she was able to do this, a few men kind of took charge of her, became her handlers, if you will, and set her up on the path to the temple uh, to tell people's fortunes for a price. Uh, the Bible tells us that they made quite a bit of money because of what she did. Uh, now, one of the groups of people that would walk every day from the city into the temple uh, included the Apostle Paul. And as Paul would walk by this young girl every day, every time she saw him, she would just start yelling and just making a big deal. And she would say, hey, everyone listen to that guy. He knows the true God and he can, he can save you. Pay attention to him. Listen to everything he says. Now, the Bible tells us, which I find kind of funny, that Paul uh, took the demon out of her, but not because he was, uh, not because he cared for her and not because he was on the good team and he wanted to defeat the powers of darkness, simply because he was annoyed. The Bible says that because he was irritated that every time he walked into town, this girl would yell at him and call attention to him. At some point, he finally turns and says, in the name of Jesus, come out of her, and the demon comes out. Now, as a result of this, the men who were making all this money profiting off this girl lose their revenue stream, and they become upset. And when they do, the Bible says that they grab Paul and his friend Silas, they drag them kind of to the court area where they strip them down naked and beat them with sticks, severely beat them almost half to death, and then they're thrown in prison. Now, being in prison is, in the first century is very different than being in prison today. Uh, many of the prisons in the first century were actually just underground, kind of a manhole-sized hole cover, and you would lower the prisoner down in. The guards would actually be, be lowered down in as well. Uh, in this case, Paul was probably in a prison that had been carved out of a mountain, kind of making a, a, a man-made cave. And many times these prisons would have two different levels to them, kind of the, the front level where the not-so-bad prisoners went, and then the solitary, where the little scarier prisoners went. Paul, it says, was put in this back one, probably because they just saw him cast a demon out of a girl, and they weren't sure what they were dealing with. So they put him in this secondary prison. Now, when you were in prison there, um, there would be guards guarding both the front and back gate. It was a really bad job to be a prison guard. You didn't make much money at all, and if any prisoner escaped, you were killed. So kind of not, not great job benefits working as a prison guard. Um, additionally, it was dark. It was cold. These guys were naked. Again, they'd been stripped. They'd been beaten half to death. The only way you got food in these prisons is if someone brought it to you. So if you were in the outer prison, some of your friends could probably bring some food and the guards might give it to you as a prisoner only if your friends paid them kind of a, you know, slipped them a little bit of money under the table. But if you're in the back prison, you can forget about it. There's no way you're going to get any food. 
So these guys, the Bible says, are put down and their feet are chained or shackled to the wall. Most of the time, their legs were spread out as far as they could spread them, and then they were uh, chained very tightly. So they're in a very uncomfortable and vulnerable position like that. Also, you might want to know, there were no sewers or sewage systems really set up in these prisons, which meant if you were sitting on the ground chained like that, you were probably waist deep in human, yeah. So here's Paul and his friend (laughs) sitting in a prison cell, naked, beaten, hungry, cold, sitting in sewage and chained up. Now, for most of us, we don't find ourselves in situations like that very often. Now, maybe you know people or maybe part of your story or your family story has been uh, prison or jail or incarceration. But for most of us, we don't worry about being in that situation today. Yet, the, the, the picture of, of jail shows up all throughout the Bible. In the first book of the Bible, Genesis, we see Joseph, a young man who is imprisoned, and, and God works through him to, to save the people of Israel. In Revelation, the last book of the Bible, we see John imprisoned on an island, exiled, and God brings a vision to him that is what we have now in the Bible in the book of Revelation. And Jesus was even in prison. So all throughout the Bible, we see this idea of jail and prison and capture. Yet for most of us, it's probably not the thing we face right away. However, if you think of prison as just a metaphor for the absence of freedom, then it probably hits a little bit closer to home. Which begs the question this morning, what does your jail cell look like? Because the person who looks at their marriage after many, many years and goes... I just, there's no love anymore. It's just not what I want it to be. It's not what I thought it would be. It's not what I expected, but we've got kids, so what do I do? I mean, is that person really free? You know, the person who goes to the same job every day, but they hate it, but they can't get out of it because they're in their 40s and there's no way to find another career because you can't go back to school and you need the money this job provides, but every day you just get up and it's the same day over and over again and you don't like it and you don't like the people you work with. I mean, is that person really free? You know, the teenager who's the only one who has the worst parents in the world, right? That kid who just every day just goes, ah, the walls just feel like they're closing in on this and I'm trying to figure out what it's like to be a grown-up, but no one will let me and it's just so frustrating. I mean, that person's not really free. The person who's been abused, the person who struggles with addictions, whether they're public or private, the person who's made a mistake that no one knows about, the person who's financially stuck, and can't get out. I mean, for as much as we would say prison doesn't play a big part in our life, most of us are in a cell of some kind and have some place where we're just trying to find some freedom. Now, I think the logical step that, that, that makes sense to all of us would be that, well, if we're in prison, our goal should be to get free. That should be the next step. If you're in a cell, you want to get out of the cell. If your marriage isn't making you happy, you want your marriage to somehow make you happy. If you hate your job, you'd like to get a better job or get your job to work. If you're in debt, you want to be debt free. That's what all of us want. But here is the tension, I think. As much as we want those things to happen, it doesn't seem like they're readily available right around the corner. Now, make no mistake, I believe God can do anything he wants. I believe that God can change our circumstances in a moment if he wants to. However, if you are $50,000 in debt right now, and today you decide that you want to get free, you're probably not going to win the lottery tomorrow. You know what I mean? I mean, you're probably not going to get free that way. It's probably a process and steps and work and things that have to happen. I mean, if someone in your family has cancer... What does freedom look like there? If your marriage isn't working, a light switch probably won't flip that changes it tomorrow. So as much as we want freedom, and as much as we can identify where we're not free, it seems like freedom is a long ways away for most most of us. Because after all, if you could get free right in this moment, wouldn't you have done it already? I would have. So the question then becomes this. How do we live now, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, in, in, in a world and in a reality where freedom seems a long ways away. How do we live right now when freedom doesn't seem like it's an option? How does Paul exist and live and operate when he is chained in a prison cell? The next verse in this story, this is found in Acts chapter 16, actually tells us what Paul did. And it says, Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. So the Bible wants us to to see that in the moment of Paul's deepest suffering, 
naked, cold, hungry, chained, beaten, and in the dark, that he chooses to sing. And the Bible says he's singing in a way that everyone else is listening. The, the, the Greek word there for listening is, is a very focused, paying attention listening. It's like when Megan starts singing up here, right? And everyone's talking all of a sudden, you're like, whoa, who's doing that? Like people are paying attention. Or if, or if you're, you're in Walmart and you hear somebody start yelling at somebody else, not, not that that only happens in Walmart, but if you're in Walmart and you hear someone start to yell at someone else and all of a sudden you're like, wait, let's pay attention. How Paul and his friend are singing is, is in such a way that people are paying attention and, and, and hearing what they're doing. In the middle of his darkest moment, he sings. And I think whenever someone does something that is so countercultural or so unexpected given their circumstance, whenever that happens and you see it, we all do the same thing. We all stop and go, wait, what? Why? That's not what I expected would happen. I was at a, a birthday party with, with my wife for a friend of ours on Friday night. And we were at a restaurant, and it was kind of at the end of the night, and the DJ was playing music. Everyone was dancing and having a good time. I was sitting at a table uh, watching this all because, well, if you saw me dance, it would make a lot of sense why I was sitting at a table. But I was sitting at a table letting everyone else kind of do their thing. And off to my right uh, was, an, was an older woman. And, and I just I, I saw her sitting over here, and she was dressed to the hilt. She was elegant looking, you know, beautiful jewelry on, nice shoes, a nice dress, nice hair. Just one of those ladies that you looked at and thought, how graceful is that? And, and as she sat over there, uh, sipping on her glass of wine, uh, the DJ uh, started to play one of the great hymns of the faith, um, play that funky music, white boy. And as the DJ played this, I saw the lady set her glass down and very calmly and elegantly get up and head towards the exit. And I thought to myself, yeah, this probably is just a little bit too much for her. But when she got to the exit, she made a hard left turn towards the dance floor. And what I saw next, I, I, don't, I wish I had video to show you. I, I don't know how to understand what happened, except that I watched this older woman had to have been in her in her 70s or uh, if you're in your 70s or 80s and if you're in your 80s or 90s right she was she was up there and i watched her own this dance floor when i'm 70 i hope that i can move i mean this lady was busting moves all over everything that happened and and to the point where everyone else on the dance floor just stopped and just looks around and before long everyone's clapping you know go granny go granny that kind of thing and she is just destroying it and all anyone could do was sit there and go, what, what is happening right now? When, when elderly people dance better than the young people all around them, you wonder why. When someone is in prison and they sing, you ask the question, why? Why does Paul sing in the middle of his darkest moment? It's as if Paul had an understanding that something was going on that was bigger than his situation. It's as, if, it's as if Paul had this understanding that his circumstances were not controlled by, by where he was. Like his physical situation wasn't what dictated whether or not he was free. Paul had a profound sense that there was something more going on than just his moment, and because of that, he could sing in the middle of it. The question is, what did Paul understand? How did Paul, in a prison cell, find some level of freedom, the kind that could allow him to sing and worship and find, find joy in the middle of it? How, what did he know? Well, to answer that question, you have to know what Paul thought about Jesus. Now remember, Paul had a very profound experience when he became a follower of Jesus. He was going down the road on his way to persecute Christians when God showed up, a bright light on him, the whole thing, and Paul became a full-on follower of Jesus. He's planted churches all throughout the world. He, he wrote much of the newer testament of our, of our Bible. Paul was all in for Jesus. But what Paul specifically believed was that Jesus had showed up for him, that in his moment on that road, that God's presence had come to him. Now, when Jesus burst onto the scene, what is recorded for us in the Gospels, when he first showed up, Jesus used a specific metaphor to talk about how he brought his kingdom in the world, and that was the metaphor of freedom. Very early on, Jesus said, I have come here to set captives free. But the freedom that Jesus offered was freedom because he had showed up. I have come here, and because of that, I'll set captives free. Jesus offered freedom through his presence, and Paul understood those two things to go hand in hand. There was freedom because Jesus had shown up. 
right at the end of the book of Matthew, some of Jesus' last recorded words. He's talking to his followers and he's challenging them to take the message of his love out into all the world. And he says this to them. He says, remember, I'm with you to the end of the world, to the end of the age. I'll always be with you. In the book of Acts, when Jesus is ascending to heaven, the last thing he says, the last recorded words we have is him saying that, that he will be with us and that he will send his Holy Spirit. He says, I'm giving your, you my Holy Spirit to give you power to be able to do things that you couldn't do. So Jesus says, even though I'm leaving, I'm not leaving you. In the book of Hebrews, we're told that God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Now, those two words sound like the same thing. It sounds like God is saying, hey, I'll never leave you or leave you. But in reality, the words mean different things. The word leave means I will never abandon you. I will never let you down is actually the best way to translate it. And the word forsake means I'll never walk away. I'll never let you down and I'll never walk away. So all throughout the Bible, we see this picture of Jesus saying, I offer you freedom because of my presence. And those who trust in my presence will be able to be free in any situation. See, this is what Paul understood. Paul had a profound sense that God was with him, that his spirit was with him, that Jesus was with him, that he believed that God's presence was with him. So whatever situation he was in, it didn't matter. He could overcome it because he wasn't by himself in that moment. In a sense, Paul didn't care where he was because he knew whose he was. It wasn't like Paul was unaware of his circumstance. Paul wasn't a weirdo. He wasn't naive. It wasn't like in the prison cell that Paul gathered everyone around and said, all right, hey, thanks for coming, everyone. We're going to play some old songs and some new songs, so let's just have a good time. He wasn't singing like that. In fact, he'd been beaten half to death. He probably could barely get any words out at all. He was very aware of his situation. Trusting in God in the middle of your situation doesn't mean ignoring what's going on. It doesn't mean you can't be sad, you can't be hurt, you can't be struggling. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means that in the middle of that moment, you recognize that God's presence is still with you. And when you see that God's presence is with you, that's where freedom comes from. And that's what Paul understood. And that's why Paul, in his darkest hour, can sing songs because he knows that he's not alone. I had a friend who, uh, in, in a brief amount of time, uh, really impacted my life. His name was Patrick, and Patrick was a youth pastor in the Detroit area. And at a time when I wasn't sure I wanted to continue being a pastor, I was, I was frustrated and discouraged. Um, Patrick invited me into his home, let me spend some time with him at his church, and, and really helped me and encouraged me. And in many ways, I, I'm here today because he invested some time in my life. And a few years ago, Patrick started having some health problems. And the way he described it is, is he said, you know how if you reach out to grab a glass off the table, at the same moment you're reaching out, your brain is kind of telling you, hey, grab that glass. And it happens so fast you don't think about it. He said, I'm starting to think about it. He said, it's almost as if my brain says, hey, grab the glass, that one, grab it, grab it. And then a second later, I reach out and get it. That's weird. So he we went to the doctor and he ended up getting a diagnosis of ALS. Uh, ALS has become, thankfully, um, more in the spotlight in the last couple of years with the ice bucket challenge and some of those things, but it is a devastating disease. It is, it is completely in, uncurable, and, and he knew that. And he started to deteriorate very quickly, loss of motor skills, loss of ability to speak. And he realized that he didn't have a whole lot of time left, so he asked his church if he could give one last message, if he could present one message on the faithfulness of God. And I had the opportunity to hear this message. And it was so hard to listen to. Awkward, and his words were slurred. He'd laugh really loud. He'd snort sometimes. And you just really had to pay attention. But there was one thing he said that I'll, I'll never forget. It was right near the end of his talk. And he said, people ask me if I'm sad. And he said, of course I'm sad. I'm, I'm leaving my wife and my kids behind. And he said, people ask me if I'm angry. And he said, a little bit sometimes. Like, I don't know why this is happening to me at this time. And he said, but the number one question people ask me is if I fear death. And he said, my answer is, not a chance. Bring it on. He said, because I know who I believe in. He said, and I'm completely convinced that the God that I believe in is with me and will carry me through whatever I have to go through. In the middle of the ultimate prison cell, right? In the middle of death, what does he do? He sings. Why? because he is completely convinced that God has not abandoned him 
and that God will not walk away from him. He is putting all of his hope and trust in the presence of God and he is looking up. And because of that, he is free. Because even in prison, even in jail, you can still be free if you take all of your faith and put it in the fact that God has not abandoned you and he has not walked away from you and that he's with you in this moment. The story of Paul takes a kind of dramatic turn as it concludes here. While he is singing these songs in this prison, the Bible tells us that an earthquake comes and, and the shackles go off of his feet and the doors burst open to the prison. And in true Paul fashion, he doesn't run away because that's what any normal person would do. So instead, Paul just stays there. And the jailer, remember, who would be put to death if anyone got away, the jailer comes rushing down and says, what is going on here? Paul tells him about Jesus, and the jailer gives his life to Christ. The jailer is so excited that he takes Paul back to his home, where Paul proceeds to lead all of the jailer's family to Jesus as well. Out of this movement, a church is started in the town of Philippi. Paul starts this church, he helps get it healthy, and then he moves on. Fast forward 10 years later, and this church in Philippi, which is now strong and healthy and active, is able to send Paul a gift. He's struggling, he needs some help, and they send him a very large and generous gift. The gift means so much to Paul that he writes a letter back to these people to say thank you for the gift and to encourage them in their faith. That letter is in our Bible, it's the book of Philippians. Now, Ten years after Paul was chained up in his own sewage, beaten, naked, cold, in the dark, and he sings, and out of that a church starts. Ten years later, he writes a letter to that church. Do you know where he is when he writes the letter to the church? He's in prison again, a different prison. Ten years later, his situation actually has full circled to where he's back in prison. And listen to what he says as he writes a letter to the church that started out of his prison experience where he's now back in prison. He says the following, Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or with little. And here it is, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Paul says, I figured it out. I know now, sitting in a prison cell, that you can put me in a luxury suite or you can put me here in my own sewer. You can give me a buffet or you can starve me out. You can give me money or I can have nothing. You can do anything to me and it doesn't matter because I have figured out the secret to living in any situation and finding freedom. And it's just Jesus. It's just following Jesus. And here is the reality. If you are going to be free in the middle of whatever your prison cell is, something has to be more real to you than that prison cell. Something has to be more real to you than the situation that you're in. You want to know how to be married when it's not awesome? Jesus has to be more real to you and his presence has to be more real to you than the struggles in that relationship. You want to know how to make it through your job. You want to know how to face your addiction. You want to know how to handle your financial struggles and on and on and on. It's Jesus. And specifically, it is trusting in the fact that Jesus has not walked away from you and that he has not abandoned you. And the people who can hold on to that reality in the middle of everything else are absolutely untouchable. That's what I admire so much about Paul. What could you do to him ever? It didn't matter what you did. He was so focused on what Jesus had done for him that he didn't need anything. He didn't want anything. You couldn't threaten him because he had everything he needed. You couldn't bribe him because he had everything he needed because he was convinced that God was with him. And that's my prayer for us today. My prayer is that in whatever prison cell you find yourself, wherever you find yourself struggling to understand your circumstances or to move forward, that you would look up and that you would know that God has not abandoned you, that he never walks away from you, that he never lets you down. And if you put your trust in that, in his presence, then wherever you are, you can be free. Let me pray for us and then we'll move on. God, thank you for today. Thank you for this truth about you. Thank you that you don't walk away. Thank you that you never let us down. God, for so many of us, thank you that you're not like our our dads, our earthly fathers. Thank you that you're not like our exes. Thank you that you 
love us with an unfailing love. And so, God, I pray for myself first and for my friends also that whatever prison cells we find ourselves in, that we will live focused on the reality and with deep faith in the fact that you're here in this moment with us. So show us the way to live like that. Amen. All right, we're going to answer a few questions here this morning uh, up on the screen. You can uh, remember, you can text these questions or Facebook or, or Twitter them to uh, hashtag ask West winds. Um, so the first one says, well, why is it so difficult to feel free from our personal problems? Uh, well, I think because there are personal problems, right? I mean, I, I, I don't find it difficult to feel free from your problems. I mean, no offense, but uh, I think the reason they're hard is because they belong to us. They're the things that are right in front of us. And it's very, very difficult sometimes to have a perspective that's anything bigger than what you're facing uh, in that moment. So if you struggle to be free from your problems, I would not allow that to be something that, that, that you beat yourself up for. I mean, I think that's human nature and reality. Whatever we are struggling with, is the, is, the, is the biggest thing right in front of us. That's why it's so important to have community around you, to have people around you who have an outside perspective that's a little bit different than yours or maybe doesn't struggle uh, with the same exact thing uh, that you do. That's why I think counseling is such a big deal for so many of us. It certainly has been in my life because when someone can step into my situation with a different perspective, it makes, it, it makes a huge difference. Where is the line between following the rules and legalism? Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where that... I'm trying to think what I said that had to do with that. Um, but uh, what I would say, what I would say for, for that is this, that when Jesus came, he, he says very clearly that he came to set us free. And maybe this is where this came from. Uh, that he came to set us free from the penalty that comes from not following the rules and not following the law. So because of that, the idea of legalism, which is, which is really to say that we are somehow saved or better because we follow the rules, that was put to death. The only thing that makes us right with God is what Jesus has done and trusting in that. If you're great at following the rules but don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're, you're not where you want to be. I mean, perfect people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Uh, at the same time, I think when we have a profound sense of God's presence and when we feel that he has set us free, that's a much better motivation to live life a certain way than is the motivation just to follow the rules because you better follow them or else. So I think a much better way to live is to, is to do the things that we should do or, or become the best versions of ourselves or, or live life the, the way that Jesus says to live it because we have this sense that he's set us free and he's rescued us. All right, we have time for one more. How much is our freedom in Christ tied to our political? Is there another word on anyone else's? Um, how much is our freedom in Christ um, uh, tied to our political? I would say um, that maybe that says, it's supposed to say beliefs or, or views after that. Um, and I, I would say probably not. <laughs> they're, they're probably separate things. But I think that if you're if, the, if your overall sense is that God has set you free, then there are some things that you might tend to make a big deal out of that you probably don't need to make as big a deal out of anymore. I mean, if you really feel that you've been set free by God and his love and that's what defines your life, then which political party you vote for or align yourself with probably doesn't really matter as much as, as you might think it does otherwise. So if you have more questions, we'd love for you to send them out. We'll answer all of them on the live show and you can watch that later on in the week. So God bless you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the live show. I hope you enjoyed that message from Ben. He'll be here in the studio in just a few minutes to answer some questions from you guys that you've been sending in. If you still have questions, send them in really quick. You still have a few minutes to get them in on Facebook or Twitter, hashtag AskWestWinds. And don't forget about the live tweet um, show tomorrow at 8.30 on Twitter. Um, we'll answer more questions then and stay tuned for that. And also want to talk about uh, baptism coming up on November 15th, a few weeks away. So you still have time if you want to be baptized, if you were baptized before and you want to do it again and really just recommit your faith, we'd love to have you be involved. If you want more information about that, you can go to our website or you can stop in and um, check out the Genius Bar. They can give you more information about that. And now we have Ben in the studio, so we're going to send it on over to Jared and Ben. Yes. 
Thank you so much again, Ben. It's been awesome today. It has been. It's been fun. Uh, today, jail was the topic of conversation yes. and, and getting, you know, the freedom. There's different kinds of uh, jail. There's different kinds of, you know, things that we're trying to get out of to get the freedom we need. So patience and faith, how does that all tie into to getting free? Well, patience is definitely a, a, a big a big part of it. And I think we're, I think we're impatient for a couple of reasons. One, because... Um, you know, no one wants to be in the situation they're in. I mean, if something is bad, it naturally makes sense to try to make it better. I think the other reason is because I think we're all paranoid that we're not okay. I think, I think we have this sense, most of us, when you look in the mirror, and I, I don't mean when you're around everyone else and putting on your, you know, pretty smiley public right. face. I just think in those moments when it's just you and you just sit there and go, am, am I all right? Like, like, are these things that I'm struggling with, are these things that are hard or where I feel stuck? Like, is this the defining story of my life? So then I think we start to panic a little bit. And then we start to try to take over and try harder and do better. But I mean, honestly, how often do you see that actually working? How often does trying harder really get you where you want where you want to get, especially in areas where you really feel trapped? So, so I think the patience part of it, it just kind of lives in tension with um, with action because because you want to be patient in the sense that you want to say I recognize that I need God's help and the help of the people around me to do this and it's a process I, mean, I love the fact that here around West Winds we use the term journey a lot right it's a journey we're all on it we're all in different places we're all I like to say we're all broken just in different pieces and in different ways so um, so I think there's patience in that side, but then there's also the part where we have a responsibility. Now, I, I, I heard someone say this week, I thought it was funny, they said, if you want to see the sun rise, you can't wake up at 10 o'clock every morning and face west, because it's not going to happen, right? At some point, you have to do the things necessary to get where you want where you want to be. So, so I think patience is recognizing God's involvement in it and that it's a journey. And then the other side of that is, you know, we, we, we work towards it. We keep getting up every day and, 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 and trying again to become the people God has made us to be. Now, how tough is it sometimes to say, hey, um, I, I, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to do this for you without sounding like, uh, you know, this is just, I'm just saying this, you know, right. like you mean, I'm just like trying to, you know, I'm just trying to help you, you know, uh, it's cool. It'll be cool. I'll pray for you. Don't worry about yeah. it. And then just like, Ugh. yeah, like you mean if someone yeah. tells you they're having a hard time, yeah. And stuck. yeah, I mean, well, that's obviously the easiest thing in the world to do because, yeah. because that's, that's the Christian answer to, I, I think a lot of times when we say, I'll pray for you, what we really mean is, Hey, I don't actually want to help you, but here's something I can say to make myself feel a lot better right. and you feel a lot more confused. Now have so, a great day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good God, luck, God, buddy. God bl blessings. <laughs> so I think in that sense, uh, more often than not, don't, Rather than tell someone that you're going to pray for them, um, either one, pray for them right on the spot. Right. And if you don't feel like you can do that, then help them somehow. Figure out, figure out how you can help them. There are ways that you can do that that are better than just saying, you know, well, you know, good luck. Good luck out there. So, right. What's, what is the best way to help somebody? I mean, besides that. Well, you know, um, the, the, the guy that founded the uh, Salvation Army... Um, had a great quote where he said, it's very hard to share the gospel with someone with a toothache. And what he meant by that was that when someone is in pain or someone is hurt, the thing that they need first is probably not to hear you go, hey, good news, God loves you. The thing they need first is some kind of demonstration of that. I mean, Paul, who we were talking about this morning in, in Thessalonians says, we loved you so much that we didn't share only the gospel with you, but our very lives because you were dear to us. Like that's his way of going, we loved you, so we didn't just hammer you over the head with the big black book. You know, we, 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 actually, we actually loved you. So, so I just think it's that practical presence. I mean, finding a way to show up and, and every situation is, you know, every situation is different. But for me, I, you know, sometimes it's, it's just going, hey, you know, come with me to this or let's get a cup of coffee or I've got a group of friends getting together. You know, why don't you, why don't you come check that out? Just trying to do something that's a tangible demonstration of, of God's love. Support, yeah. walking with them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you being with me today. This is awesome experience for me today. <laughs> so fun. So uh, thanks a lot, Ben Redmond. Everybody get real loud for him right now. Come on. <laughs> yeah. That was now, terrifying. No, it was awesome. <laughs> All right, let's send it back over to Danielle. Hi. Thanks again for being here, Ben. Thanks, Jared. Um, yeah, so if you have more questions, just always send them in. We have a live tweet tomorrow. And also, if you missed today's message and you want to catch just the message or you want to watch the full live show or just the question and answer part, you can catch that at our YouTube channel. 
So head on over there if you miss anything or just want to refresh on today's sermon. Um, and right now we're going to check out the new, this week's version of the Civ video. I always think Wandenberger is the best example in the church of, of kind of the attitude that we want. Because Wanda is older mm-hmm. than Moses. Yeah. <laughs> and, and she totally <clears throat> comes to church with a kind of what next sort of posture, mm-hmm. which I go, that that's cool. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Um, and I think we probably have a lot more Wandas than we do... Um, this is McGillicuddy's, mm-hmm. you know. And it's funny because that, I don't know if the right word, but, but we've kind of groomed them that, that mm-hmm. we are grown them mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. be flexible. And mm-hmm. that's what I think is cool. Mm-hmm. Well, Craig Playford said it best. He said, people come to West Winds because they want something different. Mm-hmm. They don't always want the kind of different we're offering, but the option is just getting something else that's the same. Mm-hmm. And that kind of thing. Yeah. In, in one way, that, that's why people are here. Welcome back again, everyone. So earlier on in the service, we asked you guys to answer our poll question. And our poll question was, in which area of your life do you feel the most imprisoned? And the possible answers were relationships, job, money, or personal issues. So we've had that question going on throughout the week, but then mostly today. And so far, about 92 people answered that. But the most people said that they felt the most imprisoned by money. And so I don't think that's too surprising. Were you guys surprised by that? Not really. I think money can lead into personal issues too. So I mean, right? It's, I don't know. It would have been one of those two for sure. Yeah, they all kind of, kind of fall into each other a little bit yeah. at some point. It was a really personal question, so we want to thank you guys for submitting that and for engaging with that question. Thank you for doing that. All right, coming up, Halloween, October 31st, Saturday night. Oh, it's well, Saturday. Yeah, I guess yeah. early yeah. evening, six to eight. You got to have your family here. Get your kids, get them dressed up. It's inside, so no matter the weather, it doesn't matter because we're having a good time and it's going to go off without a hitch. Mm-hmm. And remember tomorrow night, again, the tweet up at 8.30 on Twitter. Engage with us in the conversation. Send in your questions, thoughts. Love to hear from you. And we want to thank everyone who helped make this show possible. We want to thank Ben for joining us in an interview and for Jacob for coming in here. I also want to thank the crew who keeps us on schedule. Thanks to Tyler for checking our sound and Briston for moving everything around. And thanks to Joel for putting up with our shenanigans all the time. I really appreciate having that entire team here. Oh, and yes. thanks to the wonderful co-hosts yes, for, for being me. here. It's awesome being here, so thanks for having me. Yes. All right, we'll see you guys next week, and we're going to leave you with the full-length video um, from Victor. So enjoy. Bye, everyone. See you. I see that light shine from a distant star. Suppose it took 40 million years to get to where we are. And in the scale of things, you know, it's really not that far. But what do I know? I'm just a kid who liked to play the guitar. I believe that we are bigger than we've ever dreamed. And the island we have landed upon is not quite what it seems. We are like the water flowing in our stream that runs down to the river that washes into the sea. And there's a current pulling us closer to where we're meant to be. I believe that we are bigger than we've ever dreamed. You might be a single drop of water in the ocean, or a grain of sand upon an endless shore. If one flash of light set the
Same. 